Hello and welcome to Trinity Online. I'm so thankful you are here. My name is Melissa and I'm your host. Whether you are a faithful online worshiper, you're on the road for spring break, or this is your first time with us, welcome. We have a few things to get you caught up on and great ways for you to connect with us here at Trinity. First off, you can like, share, and subscribe to our page or to the post. That would be awesome if you could do that. Next up, we would love for you to check in. Um, the way you can do that is scan this QR code, or you can click this link right here or found in the description and let us know you worshiped with us today. Do you wanna dive deeper into this morning's message? Maybe you just need help processing it just a little bit more? Click this link right here or the link found in the description and that'll take you to our worship guide. It's a great resource and tool to help you process the sermon just a little bit more and to continue the conversation. Now you guys, Easter is just around the corner and we want you to hop your way over into our Easter extravaganza happening April 9th right here at Trinity. We're gonna meet over by the flagpole. We'll have inflatables, the park will be available. We're gonna cook hot dogs and have all kinds of goodies that morning. And when I say goodies, I want to also include that we are going to have two Easter egg hunts. They'll be broken down into age groups. The first one will happen at 11.30 and the second one happens at 12.15. In between all of that, we're gonna have different booths for kids to do activities. We'll have the inflatables for kids to jump on and just have a great time celebrating Easter. So make sure you join us April 9th from 11 to one. This Lenten season, we have partnered with One Hopeful Place for our Lenten mission project, Hope in Action. During Hope in Action, we hope to raise $2,500 to help One Hopeful Place, who serves as a front door or stepping stone for those seeking permanent housing. They help 50 men and 11 women in our very own community. And as a lot of you know, Trinity is historically known for making an impact on our local community. So let's continue this. Help us meet our goal of $2,500. In the last two weeks, you guys, listen to this. We have raised 80% of our goal. So why not exceed it? Why not go above and beyond like we are known to do? Let's love our community and just blow the roof off of our goal, you guys. So a big thank you to everyone who has already participated in our Hope in Action project. If you haven't participated yet and you wanna get involved, it's not too late. Your donation, no matter how big or how small, will make a lasting impact on our community. So you can give um, online if you go to our website at trinityfwb.org or you can drop a check by the office and let us know that it is for our Hope in Action Lenten Mission Project. You guys, life is so full of noise. There's our phone, there's the TV, there's work, there's school pickup, there's all kinds of things that take our mind all over the place. Not all these things are bad, but they do tend to overwhelm and overstimulate us sometimes. And during this Lenten season at Trinity, we want to get some clarity. We wanna clear things up, we wanna quiet things down, and we wanna focus on God to have some quiet, still time with God. Last week, we talked about going from a place of complacency to consistency. And today, we're gonna talk about not placing blame. We're gonna go from blaming others in our lives and we're gonna replace it with some self-examination. 
The other day we were talking about how if we would just stop placing blame everywhere else and just take a step back and look at the big picture and then put ourselves into action, there might be a little less darkness in the world. There might be a little less noise in the world. So we're gonna jump into this message with Pastor Scott. But first, please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together and worship, whether that be in person or online. Lord, I lift up those that are traveling for spring break, that you would just grant them safe travels and that you would protect them from all the things that they may encounter. Lord, I ask that you would be with Pastor Scott and his message, that his words would be only your words and that they would fall on ears that are ready to be put into action ears that are ready to take a step back and evaluate a situation before we place blame on others. Lord, help us have hearts like you. Help us be your hands and feet. It's your name we pray. Amen. Welcome, friends. We're so grateful that you're joining us. Lovett Weems, the preacher, he has some great advice for leaders. He says, leaders do not need answers. Leaders must have the right questions. Did you hear that? Leaders, we don't, we don't need to have the answers to things, but we need to know the right questions to ask. We're preaching a series called Clarity. It's about discerning how we are to be and live in this world. How are we to hear God's voice and God's call on our lives there's so much noise around us and so many things that distract us. And sometimes what distracts us are the wrong questions, questions we really don't need to answer. Now, there are different types of questions. For example, there are questions to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. Now, I love astronomy. I love reading about astronomy. I, I love reading about all these new planets astronomers are discovering around other stars. And I, I'm just amazed how they can detect planets by just the small wobbles in, the, in their stars or the, just a slight dim in the, the light of the stars as a planet passes in front of it. I, that amazes me and I love reading about it, learning about it. It satisfies my curiosity and that's good because God created us to learn. But what difference does that make in my life? It really doesn't make a difference in my life. That's one type of question. Another type of question I'm going to call gossip questions. So those are kind of questions where we, we want to know something, and, and honestly, sometimes that knowledge makes us feel a little superior than others and look down on others. Gossip questions. You may know the singer Taylor Swift. She sings a song called, I Bet You Think About Me. She's, it's about a breakup she had. And she says, when you realized I'm harder to forget than I was to leave, I bet you think about me. Now, I wonder, who was that guy that she's singing about? And I bet you wonder that too. Will that, knowing that really make a difference in my life? It, it won't. And, and sometimes when we dig into those kind of questions, well, it can make us look down on others. And then, then it becomes destructive. Old Testament scholars, the Old Testament tells us that the Old Testament had a language for negative and derogatory speech about others. And the Old Testament called it evil speech. It, it brings us down. There's nothing good about it. So that's another type of question people ask. And then there's a type of question, I'm going to call it existential type question. That's a question about who, who am I? How am I to live? What am I to do? Jesus loved to ask these existential questions all the time. For example, Jesus once asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And the disciples said, you know, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say one of the prophets. But then Jesus dug deeper and he said, but who do you say that I am? See, that's that existential question. Who do you say that I am? And if you read the Gospels, you'll notice that sometimes, especially in John's Gospel, 
Jesus is asked a question, but then he starts answering what's basically another question because leaders know how to ask the right questions. And sometimes Jesus was simply asked the wrong question and he shifted to answer the question that needed to be answered. We're talking about clarity. And we're talking about a passage where people were asking the wrong question and Jesus had to correct them and show them what the right question was. I'm, I'm reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Jesus responds to comments people had about a couple of tragedies that happened around that time. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Holy Spirit, wherever we're listening, engaging this message, guide us, guide us in our hearing, guide us in our listening to hear your truth and give us the wisdom to apply it to our lives. And, and guide my words right now as I preach so that I'll truly proclaim the message you have for me and that my words won't bring any harm, but will just convey the, the truth that Jesus saves us and gives us new life and new beginnings. We pray this in his name. Amen. I rejoice that God gives us the grace to change our lives, that we can change our lives. And I rejoice that God gives us the grace that we can bear fruit. And that's what the word repentance means. Repentance means that we change our hearts and our minds. We stop heading down the wrong way and we turn around and head in the right direction. So repentance means more than just feeling bad about wrongs that we do. Repentance is changing, changing our attitudes, changing our actions. And bearing fruit, that's when our lives produce good virtues, moral excellences, when, when we become a blessing to this world and others rather than a curse or a burden. This sermon series is about clarity. How do we discern how God calls us to live? And we affirm that Jesus came to save us, save us from the sins, from all that's wrong and broken in our lives that keeps us from being our best selves. Well, Jesus came to save us from that, to heal us from that, so that we become the, the vibrant, full fruit trees that we were always meant to be, providing fruit and blessings to those around us. And, and part of the, this emphasis of today's sermon is that we're talking about clarity and we're going to move from blame, blaming others to becoming responsible for our own actions and attitudes. We're, we're moving from blame to being responsible because we believe that will give us clarity on, on how we are to hear God. Here's the good news. I, I want you all to hear this. God does not want to condemn us. God does not want to destroy us. God wants to save us. I say this because Jesus came to give his life for us. I mean, we've all fallen short of who we are meant to be. As we say in one of our prayers of confession, we have left undone those things that we ought to have done. We've done those things that we ought not to have done. And the tragedy of our human condition is that, yeah, we, we go the wrong way. We call that sin, missing the mark, going off the right path. And we're all victims of sin, of others' sin against us. Others have harmed us in ways, maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally, but we all carry those scars of others' sins against us. But then at the same time, we too cause scars in other people's lives, whether intentionally or unintentionally. It's like 
people who are sinned against in turn become sinners against others. I'm thinking about children who were abused growing up. They, they suffered some horrible, awful things, but then sometimes they themselves become abusers of others. So it's kind of a vicious cycle, that, that this brokenness, and we're all responsible. And that's why Paul says in Romans 3.21 that we all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And our temptation is to, to look at others rather than look at ourselves. And, and whenever we see a problem in this world, something wrong is to say it's their fault, not our fault. Years ago when I was in middle school, and yeah, I was in middle school at one time, uh, at the church we worshiped at, they had children's church and then Sunday school for children. And, and I remember I was sitting in the back row with, with friends, my friends, Billy, David, and Buddy, and, and we were we were rude. We were making sarcastic jokes, rude comments, trying to be funny, laughing out loud, being very interruptive during this worship service. And then after the service, the, the worship leader, a woman named Norma, she pulled me aside and she reprimanded me. And she, she, she told me, I called me out and said she was going to tell my parents. And, and all I kept saying was, well, what about Billy? What about David? Their jokes were worse than mine. And uh, now as an adult, I know that she was right to call me out. She did the right thing. And I was a fool because I was blaming others rather than focusing on myself. See, blame is an avoidance strategy. And that's something we all do at times. We turn to others and blame them rather than accept responsibility ourselves. And as we grow in wisdom, as we grow in Christian maturity, we begin to realize that, yeah, that the problems in the world are not just other people's responsibilities, other people's faults. I'm involved as well. How is Christ calling me to change, to repent? Houston Smith, he was a religious scholar, and, and he grew up as a uh, son of Methodist missionaries in China, but Houston Smith, he asked the question, which is the right question. He asked that people in, in religion, they seek the answer to the question, how can I be loved and accepted when there's so much within me that's unacceptable? See, that's the right kind of question. That's the existential question. That's what Jesus came. And, and to love us and, and, and to accept us, and, and we are loved and accepted through Jesus. And so Jesus tells this wonderful parable, a, a parable of a tree that's not bearing fruit. I mean, a fig tree is meant to bear fruit. It's planted in the garden to bear fruit, to give life to those around it. But the fig tree is not bearing any fruit, not just one year, two years, but for three years. It hasn't been doing anything. And so the gardener wants to cut it out and get rid of it, you know, cut it down. But the gardener says, no, now hold on now. Wait a minute now. Give me some time. Let me give it another chance. Let me dig around it and fertilize it. And then if it bears fruit, that'll be wonderful. But if not, then, then we can cut it down. See, that's a parable about grace, about being given another chance. We're recipients of grace. We're given another chance. Jesus wants to work in us and on us so that we'll bear fruit, things that are a blessing to the world around us the moral excellences that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in us. You are a recipient of grace. And if one thing I want you to hear from the sermon is that you are a recipient of grace. You're a beloved child of God and, and you're loved and accepted. And Jesus demonstrated this love and acceptance and worked out this grace by going to the cross for you and for me. So that's the good news. And our response to this good news is that we take responsibility for our effort and attitude in life. That's a phrase that we, uh, we can always control our effort and attitude. That's from Tom Glavin, the retired Braves pitcher, the Hall of Famer. I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a moment, but I want to go back to the biblical text, the story here that I read to you, because what's going on here? Well, at that time, there are a couple of tragedies that happened, and if they had the news on TV, this would have made all the 24-hour coverage if they had that back in those days. But there were a group of Jewish people from Galilee who had gone to the Jerusalem for the Passover and Pilate, who was the Roman governor of that area, he killed them, he slaughtered them for whatever reason, maybe that they were doing things he didn't like, but he killed them. And that political leaders, dictators can do some horrible things to other people. Well, we're not surprised by that. We just need to turn on the news and see what Putin is doing in Ukraine. Another event that happened was that a tower in the wall of Jerusalem that was by a water reservoir called Siloam, a, a tower collapsed. Maybe it was the scaffolding around the tower, maybe the whole tower collapsed, we don't know, but people were killed by this accident. And 
And we see buildings collapse in, in our day too. Just remember what happened in Miami not that long ago when the condominium collapsed. Now, people were asking questions in response to these tragedies and some were intellectual curiosity questions. Some were kind of gossiping, asking, you know, what did these people do wrong? What, what had they, I mean, what, why did they suffer this way? What had they done? And I think Jesus sensed the tone in the voice. And, and so Jesus, he dismissed those questions that that was, remember a leader knows how to ask the right questions. And here was the right question that Jesus had for them. It's not a question of, you know, what did they do? What were they doing wrong? The question is, what about you? How are you living? He said, were they worse than you? No, but unless you repent, you will perish as they did. What about you? Where are you? That's the right question. I mentioned that phrase from Tom Glavin, that saying that we can always control our effort and our attitude. At the All Sports Banquet here in, in Fort Walton Beach that he spoke at recently, he shared the story of, you know, Tom Glavin, he was a two sports guy growing up in school. You know, he played baseball and hockey. He could have been a professional hockey player. He was that good. Uh, but uh, he was telling the story as a child, he was, father was driving him back from a hockey game that he had played in and Glavin's team had lost. And Glavin was sitting in the back of the car pouting and just being rude, having a bad attitude because his team had lost. And then his father pulled the car to the side of the road and, and his father turned around and, and said to Glavin, he said, if you're gonna have this kind of attitude, then I'm not gonna drive you anymore to the games. And that was a uh, life lesson for Glavin. That was in a way a wake up call. That was a transforming moment because Tom Glavin realized that you know, there are a lot of things in life you can't control. You can't control you know, whether you have a bad coach on your team. You can't control whether the officials, uh, the refs are, are doing a lousy job and making bad calls. You can't control that. But Glavin said you can always control your effort and your attitude. I want you to hear that we're, we are not passive victims in life. By that I mean, yeah, I, I know that sometimes we experience sin against us. Sometimes we suffer injustice and unfairness in, in awful ways. And I, I know that happens, but still we always have choice in life, how we respond to injustice and unfairness. We have a choice about what goes on in our hearts and our minds. And God gives us the freedom to control our effort and our attitude. There's a great passage. It's, it's uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Paul gives these words of encouragement to the Corinthian church. He says, No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will always provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. No matter what happens to us, God gives us the grace to respond in Christ-like ways, and in ways that do not corrupt our heart, do not corrupt our mind. That's what I mean about taking responsibility for our effort and attitude, which is not shifting the blame, but it's saying, well, what am I responsible for? See, remember, I'm talking about clarity. How do we gain clarity? We gain clarity by stopping our, all our focus on what others are doing wrong, because that's what the world wants to do. And we hear that so often that these people are the problem in the world if they just changed. So we stop doing that and instead we start focusing on our own hearts and ask, well, how is Jesus calling me to change? What is Jesus calling me to do? How am I called to be more faithful? There's a story in John chapter 21, the end of John's gospel, where the resurrected Jesus comes to Peter and the disciples who've gone back fishing on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus renews his call on Peter's life. And then after he renews his call, Jesus says to Peter, follow me. And Peter, he kind of looks around at another disciple and says to Jesus, well, what about him? And Jesus says, if it's my will that he remains until I come back, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, you know, stop focusing on what other people are doing. You focus on what I'm calling you to do. You've got control over that. That's what I'm calling you to do, follow me. So here's something that may help. Let's do that. And it's simply the practice of 
prayer of confession. Confession is when we say, you know, I'm sorry, God, for what I did or for what I should have done but didn't do. We, we say that and then you know, we receive again God's forgiveness and God's assurance that we're God's beloved children and we can grow, we can change. So we practice prayer as a confession. And, and here's a way to do that. Uh, there's a, St. Ignatius taught a prayer practice called the prayer of examine. That's simply we examine our lives. We examine what happened uh, during the day at night or we examine what happened through the previous week, we kind of focus on where did we experience blessings and consolations. Where Then we lift up prayers of thanksgiving and praise to God for those experiences of blessings and consolation. But then also as we review the day, as we remember the day in God's presence in prayer, we'll remember times when we experienced desolation, times when life was tough, times when we were not the, the way we know we were meant to be. And when that happens, we offer prayers of for help to God and also prayers of confession, I'm sorry, and we receive God's grace. That's a great prayer practice for us all to do. I offer that to you as a way for you to grow as a follower of Jesus. Uh, I can do a prayer of examine. I'm not afraid to say prayers of confession because of a the gospel. I'm, I'm saved by grace through faith. I'm loved and accepted by Christ just as I am. But there's a quote that I it's so important to me. I wrote it in the back of my Bible some years ago, and I just read it again recently. It's from a, a Roman Catholic monk, Don Augustine Gullorant, and it's the following quote. He says, God will know how to draw glory even for our, from our faults. Not to be downcast after committing a fault is one of the marks of true sanctity. I love that. Isn't that great? God will know how to draw glory even from our faults. Not to be downcast after committing a fault is one of the marks of true sanctity. So we're not afraid to pray for prayers of confession because we know that through this we will grow. We're not afraid to take responsibility and, and work on our effort and attitude because we know that when we do that we'll grow and we'll become more and more like Christ. So we're talking about clarity. How do we discern what God's will is for our lives? How do we hear God's voice amidst all this noise in the world. And we do this, we gain clarity by asking the right questions, not by asking the wrong questions, but asking the right questions. And, and the right questions are not shifting the blame to other people. The right question is, well, how am I to act, God? How are you calling me to respond? And when we do that, we'll, we'll grow in clarity. We'll grow in understanding of how we are to live and act. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Scott, for that message. Hopefully, we can take a step back, and instead of placing blame, we can examine what is really happening and try to find God's heart in it. Make sure you guys like, subscribe, and return next week for next week's message. Make sure you also dive into our worship guide and use it as the tool it's supposed to be. We'll see you guys next week. Have a great week.